like really large companies have the luxury of spinning up a decently sized infrastructure team which automates all of this kind of stuff not everyone has the luxury of spending so much effort on just this piece so what we decided to do is to essentially standardize this kind of orchestration productize it and make it available for pretty much anyone to use and benefit from you know this kind of automation Hey, this is Brian, and you're listening to Jamstack Radio, a bi-weekly series where we discuss modern web development with maintainers, founders, and developers. Jamstack Radio is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor and developer for startups. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter, at Jamstack Radio. Welcome to the installment of Jamstack Radio. On the line, we got Surya Ordagunti. Uh, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Thanks, Brian. I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing perfectly fine. You're on the podcast to talk about Argonaut, uh, but usually I had folks introduce themselves to the podcast. Do you want to tell people who you are and, and what do you do? So I'm Surya. I'm currently building Argonaut, uh, but I started my career about 11 years ago uh, at Microsoft and uh, I started off on Bing ads. Okay. So uh, I was working on the pricing of ads and the prediction of the probability with which users would click on a particular advertisement and uh, and stuff like that right this involved like large scale uh, optimization and machine learning and it was a very uh, cool environment to work in it was very fast paced uh, we'd be running a ton of experiments each day and there was also a very mature framework for running things like ab tests etc After that I moved to uh, like I wanted to uh, move to startups and uh, I also moved to a slightly different domain building a first of its kind electric scooter that you can sit and ride on etc and uh, I was leading the software and connectivity hardware related efforts there uh, connectivity hardware includes things like touch screens and such well, was this one of the scooters you pick up in the city and just go ride around or was this like you buy the scooter and then have to have a software play this is something that uh, you buy and you own right uh, and okay i got it th- this was meant for the indian market so it it was also a very low cost but high functionality and high bar kind of a product so it it was a very interesting mix to both develop for and also a uh, product manage for was it successful yeah um so it's currently like a value at a half a billion dollars and uh, there are like tens of thousands of them being owned and used every day. So Okay, cool. Yeah, I I I think it's going well. Yeah, sorry to derail you. I'm I'm curious about the scooter <laughs> thing, but I know you've done way more past the scooter stuff, so yeah, continue. <laughs> so, sounds good. No, not a problem. I'm always happy to talk about this one. So, uh, specifically, uh, I I like talking about this because it was also uh, my first uh run at a startup uh, i was working there and uh, i loved the amount of ownership and responsibility that i uh, that i got to take on right so that that was really uh, great and uh, it was also like very refreshing you know at, at in a larger company you are usually focused more on the depth uh, of a of a particular smaller problem statement and in the case of a startup you know there was a lot of lot of breadth that we'd be dealing with as well uh, and that that was great after this i worked at a, a few more startups um, increasingly smaller in size uh, but these were enterprise ai related startups in the retail and hr tech space so uh, after all of this uh, i you know decided to start up on my own and i'm building argonaut so just a quick thing about argonaut um, it's an internal developer platform that helps teams automate and manage infrastructure and application deployments on their cloud right so we are essentially trying to make Uh, software operations painless so that engineering teams can focus on building features and add customer value instead of spending like months and years building a uh, software orchestration platform yeah which is like a common like i i worked at a uh, microsoft owned company github and like trying to navigate as a non engineer uh, well sorry i'm an engineer but i was not an engineer by title at github so i didn't go through all the proper training of how to deploy and orchestrate things on my own but like the their systems they built were all in-house built and you had to kind of be there when they were built to kind of understand how they worked uh so like i appreciate things that you're building which is argonaut to give that same experience but a little more clear for companies that are not microsoft and and github and etc right that that's actually uh, sort of the origin of how 
uh, I got about starting on building Argonaut, right? Which is like really large companies have the luxury of uh, spinning up like a decently sized infrastructure team, which makes it uh, efficient, like which automates all of this kind of stuff, right? Like you, uh, you push a code and, you know, there are automatic checks done and like a whole bunch of processes which kick in and eventually you see everything that is running, right? Uh, now, not everyone has the luxury of spending so much time and so much effort on just this piece, right? Because they're usually and rightly so focused on building features that their customers will end up using and paying for. So what we decided to do is to essentially standardize this kind of a product, uh, standardize this kind of orchestration, productize it and make it available for pretty much anyone to use and benefit from, you know, this kind of automation. Yeah. And that's, it's a, it's a, it's a pattern that you see like folks who work in a larger organizations and even like you come out of a startup that you seek success, like even like the scooter company, like you solve all these problems that are not in the main business problem, which is like building these operation platforms for your, your DevOps or your hosting and, and platforms. And you see, you, sometimes you get lucky and you get someone who comes out of that company that builds it for everyone else. And I, I appreciate you working at Argonaut to then share that, that experience with other folks. Because uh, it's, it's one of those things you don't realize you're going to have a problem <laughs> with the orchestration of all these things that you deploy until you do. And like, for having that experience that you're sharing with other folks through this platform, yeah, there's there's not an on ramp. So I, I guess what what's the story? I did see like YC in your background as well. Like, what's the story of like you made the decision to do Argonaut? Like, what's the sort of origin story there? So, um, firstly, you hit the nail on the head in the previous thing that you st- stated, right? Which is you don't have a problem until you do, and this this kind of thing sort of sneaks up on you uh, because one day it'll be wo- things will be working, and the next day, like everyone's hair is on fire. Right. So um, <laughs> I've been, been through that like a couple of times and just going back a little bit, I, I've always been straddling like engineering and product roles throughout my career. And uh, I worked as a product manager. I led product engineering, UX design teams uh, over like 11 years. And uh, at, at the startups I worked at, one of the things that I've consistently sort of been responsible for is the software infrastructure side of things apart from like a few other pieces. And I've helped build that from scratch a few times. And uh, that that's actually how I got started with the idea of Argonaut as well. Because in the last few years, uh, especially as companies are you know beginning to scale, etc., th- there is some kind of a convergence that's happening in terms of the kind of tool set, uh, in, in terms of the kind of processes, etc., that end up being utilized. What I'm talking about specifically are the fact that like pretty much everyone uh, now takes the cloud for granted, right? Like hyperscalers like AWS, GCP, Azure, et cetera. And uh, when you're building on top of that, usually like the cloud providers give you like a ton of building blocks, right? Like Legos that you can assemble in any kind of manner so that it fits your use case. And and that's great. And it's the most generic form of compute and storage and all the basic blocks that uh, are afforded to you. It's It's amazing. However, over the last few years, something interesting has been happening, which is uh, convergence onto, let's say, Kubernetes as like one kind of a runtime, right? Pretty much everyone's uh, beyond beyond a certain scale. And, you know, when when some kind of uh, complexity thresholds, et cetera, are reached, um, people start ar- adopting Kubernetes. Now, that, that's sort of like a nice standardizing layer, right? And then uh, th- there is a rise of generally cloud-native kind of technologies and uh, a standardization of deployment processes, et cetera, as well, uh, in terms of what is desirable. And uh, all of these mean that uh, the kind of internal tooling that we build out ends up taking a very similar shape across different companies. And here's the kicker, right? Inevitably, like this is something that has to be built from scratch in-house. Uh, and uh, it's also done by a team which is sort of usually underfunded because it's not a money making function sort of overworked because uh you know it's a small team that has a large set of things to uh, actually put together etc so it's like a very interesting problem and a tough spot right and you know this is not even talking about the fact that there's a high amount of skill and knowledge that is required just in terms of information, right? Uh, in terms of like what the best practices are, etc., which will not come and bite you somewhere down the line. So uh, all of these mean that th- there is like a reasonably large investment that is required before something happens, before, uh, you know, teams can actually start 
having a mature deployment pipeline and workflow orchestration. So that's sort of how the whole thing got started. And that was the uh, set of pain points that we set out to solve for. Cool. Yeah. So how do folks start using Argonaut and like who's the ideal person to reach for this? Right. So at this point, we are primarily looking at startups and startups basically with some kind of a complexity, some kind of a desire to scale, etc. Typically, our customers are, you know, engineering teams of sizes, about 10 to 50, 60 people in size. And th- these are folks who have a desire to scale, have a desire like and are building on top of uh, some something like uh, AWS or a GCP. Right. Like one example of uh, the kind of users that we end up seeing uh, is an IoT company, right? They provide uh, end to end IoT device management solutions. And they've grown from just a handful of people on the team and, you know, just a handful of services, et cetera, that they were managing to, uh, you know, 10 plus environments that they manage across multiple cloud accounts, across multiple clouds. And they've grown about 10x in uh, team size as well, all without having to have anyone dedicated for DevOps or infrastructure or platform engineering uh, in-house, right? Because Argonaut takes care of like a lot of the work for them. Now, you know, th- that's just one example. And this is sort of interesting because of continuously uh, streaming data and high availability and uptime kind of requirements. Now, uh, we, we do have customers in like a variety of domains, starting from healthcare to fintech to uh, IoT to, you know, good old SaaS. Yeah, and so is it that someone is already using a cloud provider and wants a better interaction using Argonaut? Uh, so we we actually see uh, a couple of different you know on ramps when people start uh, wanting to use some kind of a product like this. W- one of the common ones is something like a Heroku or you know one of the other pass providers. They're they're usually a little uh, limited in their at least in their current state. And you know when there are requirements for uh, a lot of other managed services, let's say uh, databases, queues. Uh, something like a Redis and a Kafka or more uh, ML-based workloads, et cetera, right? So uh, when all of these kind of uh, requirements come in, then uh, usually we see a desire to move to a full cloud, like a, a hyperscaler, like an AWS or a GCP or an Azure, right? At that point, there's a complete rewrite that is going to be required or a, or a complete re-architecting of their infrastructure. And that's usually very time-consuming and cumbersome. And just straight up disruptive to uh, their development flow, right? So that that's uh, one place where we see uh, a lot of people uh, opting to use something like Argonaut because uh, we we just provide like a uh, th- think of it as the equivalent of a versatile kind of an experience, but for your entire stack where you can have flexibility to define pipelines how you want and uh, set up infrastructure in your cloud without having to understand like the nitty gritty of uh, let's say how to set up. Maybe a, an RDS instance or a or a managed Redis instance or something along those lines, right? Uh, we we just help package all of that together. Uh, another interesting case is when uh, people want to shift from doing uh, just deployments onto VMs, uh, EC2 instances or GC instances to something like a Kubernetes because they've hit some kind of a complexity. So that's another place. And a third case that we do see is when folks start trying to look for you know, DevOps engineers and things like that, when they want to make their first hire because they're hitting some kind of a complexity. At at that point, uh, we've had a few cases where folks just use Argonaut instead of getting someone on board who will then take a few months to build out all of these kind of tooling. They just use Argonaut to get started and uh, reduce the uh, amount of overhead and bring in a lot of efficiency and developer experience to their team. Okay, cool. And then I was asking earlier, because I didn't know if there was a connection. I didn't quite get it from the, the site, but between the Argo tool, which is in the CNCF, and Argonaut, like, is that is that the play with the name, or is there no connection? Uh, there, there isn't really a connection, but it so happens that we do use Argo under the hood to do GitOps kind of uh, deployments for our customers, on, on our customers' behalf. So essentially, a managed Argo is a part of uh, our offering and one of like five other things that we do. Okay, excellent. Yeah, because I, I know I'm familiar with the the project Argo. I, I'm not. I don't do DevOps. Uh, like <laughs> I'm familiar with the cloud providers and stuff. And uh, I run a company that has engineers, so like I know what the pieces are, but I don't particularly know how to do any of that. But like a, it seems like a, a tool like Argonaut 
would actually be beneficial in my current setup, in my current state. Uh, I'm curious, the, did you do research? Like, why the, uh, the inflection point of 10 engineers to, like, 50 plus? Is it at that point is when things get harder? Like, what's the, what's the significance around the number 10? Right. The, the 10 is a simple proxy for uh, a couple of things. One is the, the complexity that starts creeping in due, due to collaboration and collaborative requirements. Now, before that, you know, it's, it's usually a, a very tight-knit team and everything is just a ping away, right? At around the 10 people kind of mark, you need some kind of systems in place which will ensure that, you know, things are going smoothly. One example of that could be, you know, when people start off, uh, this, this is not a great practice, but it's exceedingly common. Uh, let's say you're on AWS and you folks spin up uh, EC2 instances, log into an EC2 instance, do, uh, you know, a git pull for the, from their latest branch and do an NPM start or whatever to uh, run their app. Right. So uh, that's, that's an exceedingly common practice, but you know, obviously this starts failing when, you know, you, you have a bunch of people and the decision making and the deployment mechanisms and the processes are more distributed, right? So uh, that is one par- a part of it. And the other part of it is the fact that uh, when you have a bunch of different services that you need to coordinate and orchestrate, and also when, when there's a maturity to the pipeline that you're bringing in, uh, that's when... Uh, things start getting complex and you end up having to spend a lot more time, like a deceptively large amount of time actually, just making these uh, systems work. Just like I, I can go into uh, an illustrative workflow if that helps, right? So just an illustrative workflow here is if, if you want to deploy an application, right? Uh, first you check in your code and then it needs to be built somewhere. Uh, and you'd ideally want to have your CI, et cetera, set up to do this for you. And then that generates artifacts, uh, either container images or binaries or what have you. And then uh, these need to be stored in a uh, in a particular location and they need to be scanned for security operations. And also you'd want to be running tests on top of that, right? Now, after all of this is done, it, it's not complete yet because you'll have to provision your cloud infrastructure across different environments. Like you'll probably have a dev and a prod and maybe like a few other environments in the middle, right? So uh, you, you'd want to provision all of this cloud infrastructure uh, that includes things like your databases, your storage buckets, and so on. And then you also need to pick a runtime. Now, like there, there are like a whole variety of those, right? You'd need to pick a runtime and then all your artifacts, etc., need to be deployed to this infrastructure in the right environment uh, in a scalable and consistent manner, right? And then there's also this layer of like secret management and internal processes like approval mechanisms, etc., that start coming in. And then after all of this is set up, your users can start accessing things, but you'll still need to do things like observability, like set up observability stacks where you monitor your application for uptime and performance and errors and stuff like that. And also like day to operations like cost visibility and uh, optimization on top of that and so on, right? And general maintenance. So it ends up becoming a fairly complex beast very quickly. And all of this starts happening uh, once you are around product market fit and uh, have a product that you know your users are currently using and so on. And that is the proxy uh, for like 10 engineers that, that I've sort of roughly denoted. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And then you had mentioned Heroku in passing. And like Heroku did something really good, which is like abstract the AWS piece away from us. And then eventually build an entire ecosystem of developers who could just get their apps up and running pretty quickly. And I think what we're seeing is a transition of like Kubernetes, which now becomes like the runtime for most DevOps. Uh, there's other stuff out there, but that complication of like learning Kubernetes, I, I was I was around that time, 2012, 2015. I didn't get it. So I, I moved into the front end and started working on stuff at, at other places. But now we're seeing like that abstraction of now you have these tools like Argonaut that you can now have access to like ready available compute and CDNs and edge networks, which is extremely powerful. And uh, I appreciate this like new wave of, of infrastructure tooling where I, I don't know, the every developer can also participate. And it, it, whether you're part of that 10 or part of the 50, 
like you could participate. Like when I was mentioning that when my time at GitHub, I was outside the circle of folks who needed to know the DevOps. But every now and then I had to go reach for somebody to go ship something. And uh, I just want to like reiterate like folks who are interested in, in trying out this next level of DevOps, this next level infrastructure. Uh, Argonaut seems to be a great thing to sort of try out. So the question to you is like, how do folks get started? Is it just signing up to the website and you're good? Yeah, uh, we have a perfectly proper self-serve motion. Um, so you can just sign up, uh, connect your, uh, let's say a GitHub account, a GitLab account, uh, connect your AWS or GCP accounts. And, you know, those are just like two clicks. And then it, it's sort of similar to uh, a virtual experience uh, in the sense that uh, your actual deployment pipelines, you just select which repository you want to be uh, building and deploying from and which branch and select which environment you want to choose uh, to deploy to and you're good to go. There is a uh, a little bit of a, uh, an environment setup uh, um, that, that you'll need to do, which essentially spins up like your Kubernetes resources and sets up the network and all of that kind of stuff on AWS. So that's a you know a, just a few minutes. Cool. Yeah. Well, Surya, thank you so much for sort of walking through the Argonaut uh, experience. Uh, folks, definitely check it out. It seems like you're only one click away. Sign up, and I love the fact that you could connect your GCP or AWS and your GitHub account and do all that orchestration there. So yeah. Probably going to kick it around myself and just check it out and skip to the docs. Uh, but I do want to transition us to the picks. So these are things that we're jamming on. Could be music, could be food related. Everything's on the table. Could be tech related as well. Um, feel free. But if you don't mind, I'll go first. Uh, I got two quick picks. Uh, one pick, I just actually got off a plane from Nigeria. I spoke at the Open Source Community Africa event and uh, talked with a, a bunch of Nigerians. And every day that I was in the country, I had this one dish, which is called jollof. It's like their it's their main dish. I don't know if you, your family or if you do all the cooking. Like if you have like a main dish that you eat all the time, I know I do have. I've got like I don't know. I just had oatmeal for breakfast. I eat that every every morning. Uh, but Joe Off is like breakfast. <laughs> it's lunch. It's dinner. It's rice with tomatoes. Uh, it's tomato based, and then usually there's like um, some sort of spices in there. And I've had Joe Off in the states, but when you're in Nigeria, it's so much more spicier. So that that took me <laughs> took me back for a bit. Have you had jollof before? I have not, but it definitely checks all the things that I like about food. I I like really spicy food, and I I, I love the fact that uh, it is just it sounds ni- like ni- nice and simple to have as well. It sounds like something that I would be able to do every day. Okay, yeah, you should definitely look it up. See, I I, I personally am going to try to cook it myself. Uh, it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, <laughs> I say that, but I imagine this a Nigerian or other folks who have jollof in their country thinking, no, you can't just like think you're going to do this. <laughs> uh, but maybe it is. I don't know. I'm going to look up a recipe and try to, work, to make it myself this weekend. I really enjoyed it. It was a very, very good dish. And I enjoyed having it for every meal when I was in Nigeria. I do have a second pick, mm-hmm. which I don't know. Have you done any AI stuff? I have been playing around with it for a bit. And uh, even as a part of Argonaut, uh, there are a couple of things that we are exploring uh, one is to help with debugging and the other is to help with like cost related visibility and stuff. But yeah, been playing around with uh, Langchain and like a couple of things for a little while. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Langchain is actually my pick. We actually started leveraging. Um, so we built a, a little AI tool, uh, me and a couple interns put together like basically GitHub Copilot but not GitHub Copilot. So basically, open source has the company that I, I sort of am running right now has a little Chrome extension that you install onto your Chrome browser specifically for github.com. And we just generate PR descriptions. But the one thing that I, I've been seeing folks like source graph uh, with their Cody tool, which everyone should check that out. <laughs> it's going to be a better version than what we're making. Uh, we're building a sort of ask a repository any question type of tool. And the way that we've been doing this is through Langchain and embeddings. So we, we played around with the uh, one of the machine learning models from Hugging Face. Uh, I forget what, what which one, but ultimately what we sort of landed is using Langchain and OpenAI's embedding uh, endpoint because we don't have to host we don't have to host it on a server or anything like that. It just right. uses Langchain and uses OpenAI's um, endpoint, which is the, the I, honestly it's amazing. OpenAI gives all this away for folks to leverage, and you don't have to train any models. The models there. But the idea is that we'll be asking questions to repositories. Uh, by the time this podcast comes out, I don't know if it actually will shipped, 
but we do have a GitHub issue that's opened. And I, I probably shouldn't mention the issue, to be honest. Uh, if anybody wants to help support <laughs> this idea, we are hitting some edge cases uh, based on how intensive Langchain is. Uh, it's taking up a ton of compute. So in the AI repo for open source, it's number 192, if anyone wants to join the conversation. I'll definitely be checking this out. And honestly, it's amazing how fast this space is moving. And uh, especially with the uh, announcement of like OpenAI's functions uh, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. uh, it, it just makes automation using large language models like so much more natural in, uh, for computers now. And uh, it, it actually just uh, unlocks like a whole whole new set of uh, use cases. I've been itching to try out more. And uh, maybe I'll... I'll, I'll check out your uh, issue 192 or one of the weekends. Excellent. Yeah. Do you have any picks that you want to share with the, the audience? Uh, yeah. So something that I do uh, outside of work and I've, I've been trying to increasingly make more time for it is board games. Specifically, I, I love Euro style uh, board games. Uh, strategy board games where you know th- there is an element of engine building to it and there's also an element of uh, strategy to it and i love the fact that there is no dice involved so it's it's not luck based but it's purely deterministic I, I i love that because i do get to spend some time with people that i th- that i know and enjoy spending time with while just unwinding and it's also a nice activity to do so that that's something that i've been increasingly looking at and Similar but uh, slightly different, not not really Euro style, uh, is a, a wave of collaborative board games that I've been uh, also looking at. Uh, things like Pandemic and Sherlock, which essentially are not competitive, where you're not working against other players, but you're working as a group to figure something out or to, to make something work towards a common objective, right? And uh, th- this introduces an entirely new dynamic and I've been loving it and uh, I've been playing a few of those. So I'd really encourage you to check it out if uh, you, you have a few hours to spare or, you know, with, with a couple of people. Yeah, and Sorry, when you mentioned Euro style board games, is that specifically a style that does not include dice or is Euro style something different? Uh, generally, Euro style can include dice as well. But a, a lot of them don't. And more specifically, the Euro-style uh, strategy games are known for a couple of things. One, usually a reasonably complex set of rules. And uh, they take a few hours, like a couple of hours to play. But the core concept uh, towards all of these is the fact that there is like a, a meta to the game. And uh, there's a concept of engine building, which is, uh, you know, you essentially have specific objectives and you put together like a lot of different pieces over the course of the game so that towards the end of the game you have like a a good engine which will essentially generate points or like further you towards the objective right it involves a little bit of thinking and it's uh, pretty pretty fun to play okay cool thanks for enlightening me uh i i've definitely played games and folks who are way more into board games than i am i'm love i love hanging out with them because then they can they can fast track me into the rules right. as opposed to me like studying for probably 30 minutes before i even start the game uh so it's always fun when folks are really really excited about the game we'll bring you along for the ride and then like you have a lifelong game you play all the time so during the pandemic we actually leveraged uh my team at github when i was at the end of the pandemic uh-huh. we would do board games online and um yeah sometimes it would it would take a lot of time sometimes it'd be like a quick little there's like certain games that are quick for like icebreakers and just for having an hour on a chat while we were all inside but glad we can go outside again <laughs> Absolutely. So ju- just on that note, uh, something that we had done a couple of times is like our team is like 10 people and it's like a very nice uh, size uh, of team to play something called uh, One Night Werewolf. It's actually a very fun game to play and you can do it remotely as well. Uh, and it's still interesting. So that's something that you can check out if someone's listening and th- they're looking for ideas for a chill Friday afternoon. Cool. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for sharing the, the board games, uh, but also thanks very much for sharing about Argonaut. Folks, again, check it out. I think uh, you've got a, a pretty a beautiful site. It also, congrats on being product hunt of the day. Uh, I did see that on your, your, your website. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Before we transition out of this conversation, could you just tell us where to find the website and how to sign up and check it out? 
Yeah, uh, we are available to check out at uh, www.argonaut.dev. That is a r g o n a u t dot d e v, and you know it's free to sign up. So you can sign up and uh, check out the product, and let me know how that goes. Cool, sounds good, and uh, keep spreading the jam. That's all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Jamstack Radio. This show is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor and developer for startups. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. 